session adjournment, my junior has um, obtained the um, material parts of the 1971 Act, which has been provided to the court in hard copy, and I understand emailed as well. Thank you. Um, the um, definition of unlawfully present, which I'd hoped to find, was in the 2002 Act, but has been repealed. So we are, as my Lord, Lord uh, Justice Underhill noted, dealing primarily with the concept of illegality contained in Section 24 of the Immigration Act 1971, which relates to uh, the criminal, one of the criminal offences of either being an illegal entrant or overstay. Um, and uh, the remaining uh, sections are simply to sort of give the, give the legislative context. So, if you're not British or you don't have the right of abode in the United Kingdom, then you require permission to enter the United Kingdom. Secretary of State uh, in powers to um, permit a person to enter are contained at section 3, which section 3.1a, where a person is not a British citizen, he shall not enter the United Kingdom unless given leave to do so. Sorry. Um, section section 3.1a. Yes. Yeah, yes. And then, following on from that, we have the offences uh, set out of illegal entry and similar offences, which include... Just need to keep your voice up a bit, Miss Sorry, Weston. My Lord. There's a little bit of noise outside. Section 24 sets out the circumstances in which a person who is an overstayer or an illegal entrant will be guilty of an offence. Um, has anyone been prosecuted for being a PBOT and um, being present? I don't have uh, those figures. Um, I understand uh, from research carried out by my learned friend that there are figures relating to prosecutions, but not to prosecutions of victims of trafficking. I, I'm you. unable to say whether any of those are, are victims of trafficking. And I think it's fair there to say... There was some suggestion in the interveners submissions that there might be a defence under the Modern Slavery Act. Um, I don't have the original my fingertips, but you, I'm sure, do. Um, I think it was section 49. It's the one that's very often relied on by those who have been trafficked and who are then caught working in certain illegal circumstances. Oh, se section 45. I'm yeah, thinking. thank you. Um, But I can't. I can't point to a policy of prosecuting uh, victims of trafficking of no. defence. Um, uh, I, I did. I, this probably won't take matters any further. I didn't not ask anyone to look at it now. But I did myself do some search over lunch. There is a case which I should have remembered. A guy gave a leading judgment called Akin Yemi. Yes. Which does consider the meaning of lawful um, presence. Uh, country for in a particular context. That's the citizenship case, I think. Uh, sort of. Yeah. No, deportation not, not and citizenship. It's a deportation yes. case. Um, but it refers to two earlier cases in uh, House of Lords or the Supreme Court which go different ways. Um, and which the, and the, the answer is it all depends for what purpose you're asking the question. Yes. And, and I think the British Nationality Act now makes specific provision for who is unlawfully present. But I suppose the point I would put to you arising out of all this mm. is, with respect, just to say they are unlawfully here doesn't really go to the heart of the question. What goes to the heart of the question, if your submission is otherwise correct about the correct approach to Section 12, is does the status that they have, whatever label you put on it, uh, uh, seriously prejudice their recovery? Yes. You say it does. Yes. Really matter. We shouldn't be spending a lot of time deciding whether it's lawful for some purposes and 
not for others. But it's material. It's not determinative, but it's material. Um, that's pursuant to my submission that lawful presence, in my respectful submission, is what ECAT contemplates when looked at the um, not residents, I'm not talking about residents or local residents. Well, you've just seen from the explanatory note, the explanatory yes. report, it doesn't contemplate law, it actually uses the phrase illegal presence. Um, what that does is simply identify the, the class of person for whom these provisions will be relevant. Right. Because all, but it doesn't say, and they must therefore be made legal. No, it doesn't say that. But I, I'm, not, I'm not putting my case out. Um, what I've said is that 10, 12 and 13 have to be read together. 13 well, makes some specific provisions in respect to authorisation. I'm wondering, because there is a little bit of learning on uh, what 13.1 means, I'm, not, I'm wondering if we might not turn that up. It's in the case of a Tamil one. It's at tab 42. Uh, electronic bundle number 1570. And the uh, court's consideration of um, Article 13 begins at paragraph um, 75. So this, I think it's fair to note that this wasn't a case concerned specifically with a question of authorisation because it was dealing with um, uh, what the significance was of historic uh, trafficking in the guidance as it was at the time. However, in particular, if we look towards the end of paragraph 75, I don't know if the court just wants to read through 75 and 76. an example of a, a, if I could call it a gap in the guidance identified by the court relating to Article 13.1 and what <coughs> obligations arose as a consequence of particularly the last two lines of that article. Although uh, the court goes on uh, at paragraph 82 to look again at the, the significance of Article 31. The um, uh, point raised there isn't one which affects this case. It's a different issue. The other case that I wanted to turn up is the case of I.J. Costo, because that's another... I've, I've mentioned it without turning it up previously. Um, that's a case, uh, and it's at tab 57. Um, okay. uh, it's, um, my lord, it's 2093. Thank you. Again, um, is a case concerning uh, a permission to work, and um, it was a case in which um, Mr. Justice Bourne uh, identified what Mr. Justice Mostyn would call a policy lacuna, but 
which I would more comfortably call uh, gaps in the guidance or guidance failing to reflect the um, uh, the convention. If we have a look at paragraph um, seventy five. Um, and what's referred to there, I don't know if the court just wants to read from 75 to 78. What's the victim of trafficking in this case also an asylum seeker? Um, may I turn my back for a moment? Um, I think so. Um, she certainly made a claim for asylum, paragraph 5-4. I'm grateful. So the, uh, paragraph 360A of the immigration rules is the case about allowing asylum seekers well, it's the, sorry, it's the rule, the new rule about al allowing asylum seekers to work, isn't it? After 12, after 12 months. Am I, am I, is that not right? I think so, but I'll have to turn my back. Yes, I'm, I'm getting nods from those behind me. Um, here, um, the court found that um, the bright line rule being applied by the Secretary of State was in What bright line rule was that? Well, that was as stated in paragraph 368. So, well, I, 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 don't, I don't know what, um, because I referred to it, I don't know exactly what it says. It's set out here somewhere. Yes. So, Where? which paragraph? The um, reference to the rule is at paragraph 29. And in particular, at the top of paragraph of um, on the following page, two one zero two. in particular paragraph 76 so this was this was a circumstances in which the uh, decision maker had uh, apparently misdirected themselves as to whether they had a discretion that's what's dealt with at paragraph 75 but at 76 um, what the court concludes is that in a in applying or exercising the discretion the decision maker must have regard to the primary objectives of ECAP and then makes reference in particular to Article 12 requiring that the state shall adopt necessary measures. Was the policy amended after this? Um, yes, I understand that it was. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not able to put my finger on which policy it was with the result from the amendment, but I can do so um, uh, for the court uh, if required. I suppose implicit in that is do we know whether the Secretary of State sought permission to appeal? I, I understand that there wasn't an appeal, but I don't know if it was applied for and reviewed. Um, Mr. Tan might be able to assist me as court attorney. Forgive me. Um, I'm informed by junior counsel for Mr. Butler that um, uh, there is intelligence that an application for permission wasn't made by the Secretary of State in that case. Wasn't made? Was not made.
reason I turn up IJ Kosovo is that although it refers to a different provision, it's a similar situation, we say, where the decision maker has a discretion to exercise. And the question is, has that decision maker been properly directed? Uh, guided in the guidance um, as to the significance that a person who's applying to regularise their status is a, a potential victim of trafficking. What, 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 what's the significance of that? Um, and how does that factor into that, the exercise of that discretion? So this was a reasonable grounds um, claimant applying also for asylum. That's right. Um, I, I and then the policy had to be amended to make sure there was no inadvertent breach of Article 12. Might be thought to be a relevant policy for us to look at? Yes. Yes, the policy is at, the amended policy, and I'm grateful to um, those behind me, is at 1121. Uh, Thank 1, you. 1, 2, 1. Oh, that's the relevant part of the policy, um, not, not the first page of the policy. So the authorities bundle. It's policy bundle. Policy. 1121. 1121. And is this good enough now or? Yes, I don't understand it to have been subject to further challenge. We would say we're, we're in similar territory here, where we say the exercise of the discretion in question, the fact of a person being in the in the uh, uh, attracting the being in the class of person that attracts the entitlements under uh, article 10 to 12 and 13 is a relevant factor um, in particular having regard to as it says here physical psychological and social recovery and the reasons why that's important i.e so where are you reading from this is from the amended policy application of discretion at the top of which 1121. page one one two one my lord yeah I didn't see anything about psychological. Where's that? It's a bottom paragraph. Oh, I see. It'd be relevant consideration with regard to their physical. It, it's simply the sort of policy one might expect to find as a consequence of the order made by Mr. Mos uh, Mr. Justice Mosty in a different context. The challenge wasn't, of course, to the fact that they couldn't have it for 12 Sorry? months. The challenge was not to the fact that they couldn't ha have the right to work for 12 months. It was the shortage occupation test, as I yes, understand. Yes, exactly. But, but we would say on normal public law principles, the fact that a person is a potential victim of trafficking in that reflection recovery period is a relevant consideration for the exercise of discretion whether or not to regularise their status. And if you had a policy which excluded that, that factor or, uh, or didn't properly uh, guide a decision maker as to the significance of that factor, then that policy would be unlawful on normal public law. And in fact, that's the point we make in our second respondent's notice. In turn, we set that out. <coughs> so then, um, 
apart from saying that we um, adopt what the intervener says about Article 13 in particular, in fact, there's not a, not, not a part of their submissions with which we would disagree. Um, and obviously we adopt our own skeleton argument. The only point in my submission that I was uh, going to come to was um, the impact of Article 4, which we also raised in terms in, um, in the respondent's notice. And we rely on our skeleton argument on the case of DCL as being of assistance. I know the courts will be familiar to, lot, to a large degree on the sort of territory mapped over by Article 4 in the context of trafficking um, duties. But the case of DCL does have something to add. And if I could turn that up, it's uh, tab 64 of the authority of page? Uh, it starts at 2306. Thank you. And, uh, this was a case um, about um, uh, Vietnamese nationals uh, who'd been um, arrested and uh, <coughs> claim the protection of um, tra anti-trafficking duties. At page, um, a paragraph 150, electronic bundle number 2354, the court um, addresses the uh, state's positive obligations under Article 4 in, in the context of the rights of victims. And um, it's clear from the court's summary of the scope of positive obligations under Article 4, we say, that it maps across the same territory that we have prayed in aid from the convention, the uh, ECAT, In particular, if we have a look at paragraph 153, and in, the, in specifically the last sentence of that paragraph. So without uh, repeating the submissions I've made as to, to the combined effect of Articles 10, 12 and 13 in their appropriate uh, convention context, we say that Article 4 also um, gives rise to uh, positive obligations to take steps which may include in an appropriate case, exercising a discretion to regularise a person's immigration status. Are you, are, you, <coughs> are you actually saying, which I think would go further than any case I've seen, that every provision of Chapter 3 of the Convention, the ECAT, should be treated as implicit in Article 4 of of the Human Rights Convention? No. I'm, I'm saying that um, that last sentence is plainly designed to map across. I don't 10, know what you mean by map across, it's a metaphor. Right. Well, I mean to reflect the same content of the duties in 10. The, the, the well, then you are saying what they. If it's, not, if not the whole of Chapter 3, 10, oh, oh, I see. 12, and 13. And that it's using very similar language, and it's based on. Um, so, okay, can I then? But are you are saying that the intention of that last sentence is that the Strasbourg Court is saying that the full provisions of ten, twelve, and thirteen uh, reflect.
reflect uh, arise under the self same duties arise under Article Four. I I don't I don't go that far. I say that the the analysis of the uh, Strasbourg Court in this case means that I can argue that it's open to me to argue, it's open to a claimant to seek to enforce or seek to assert um, a, a possible entitlement to a particular measure for the same reasons as, the, the, as have been argued under 10, 12 and 13. So it's I don't say that the that the that, that, that the um, consequence of this decision is that um, I can establish a right to immigration status. I simply say that the direction of travel of the Strasbourg jurisprudence, as summarised in this case, is clearly that the purpose of the protection measures under Article Four. include assisting victims in their physical, psychological, and social recovery. Those being the same words as apply in the context of the articles of ECAT on which I rely, we say it's reasonable to submit that for the same, uh, <coughs> for the same reasons and purposes, It's open to the to the uh, respondent to assert that in certain circumstances, Article Four may mean that the uh, uh, that the um, Secretary of State has to regularise a person's status. And I and I say and I say that obviously without I say that in the context of putting the highest remedy being the exercise of a discretion. So in the context, rather than, rather than, I'm not saying that there's a basis on which I can claim a right to a status. What I'm saying is that the remedy afforded by the court in this case, by the court below, that is to say, identifying a gap in the guidance applies equally to Article 4 as it does to um, ECA. Am I right in thinking that although this might have been an important alternative way of putting the case, if uh, Mr. Tam had been maintaining the justiciability argument, yes. where we now are, it doesn't really make any difference to your case because he is saying it is justiciable. Article 4, although in other circumstances there was a claim for damages, for example, you might have wanted to rely on Article 4 mm -hmm. so as to take um, advantage of Section 8 of the Human Rights Act. Uh, in the issue as it is actually before us, it doesn't make any difference. No, I, I, and you're, the, the court's right. If It would have been different if I'd been saying I could get something more out of Article 4 than I can get out yeah. of the ECAP, but I'm not saying that. Um, that leaves me with the issue about the uh, respondent's notice, um, and it's, uh, I have copies of, there were two respondent's notices in this case, but I understand that the, the court was of the view we couldn't submit or shouldn't submit another respondent's notice form. I don't know why that is, but anyway, only one initial one went in. So there was no form to go with the second respondent's notice. Sure, uh, well you may, which, which respondent's notice are you talking about? The one we were talking about this morning yes. was the first response. That's right. For Article which there is 13. a form, Yes, there is. Which I got just before we came in. But yes, that's right. And that confirms yes. what you'd already told me, that this was a case of supporting the judge's order on different traditional yes, grounds. Yes, it, it, it 
was, I mean, it, 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 that's right, but I think it's fair to say that if we'd have been given the option in the alternative, we would have taken it. But the form doesn't give that alternative. That, that, no, that no, you, you appeal against the order. If you want... But, if uh, you say... Yes. Oh, I see what you mean. Um, a primary position is uphold um, the order of Mr Justice Mostyn. Our secondary position would be, if you're not with us on that, but for the reasons we, we say, the court should um, uh, issue a revised... I've action. never had to think about this. Uh, I, uh, is that that's, not an option allowed under section That's an six? appeal. If you, if you don't like the order that was made and you want another order, either additionally or alternatively, you appeal. And you pick the box on page 3 of 15 in section 6, Mark, I appeal the order. And then you give your reasons, because. M my submission would be, obviously subject to anything Mr Tan says, that while it's unfortunate, um, and the court has rightly observed, that the wrong box has been ticked, we would respectfully submit that the court's heard full argument, and if the court considers that it's appropriate, this being a public law matter, to make the order um, in respect of um, uh, Article 13, then the court shouldn't be prevented from doing so it's by not the just the wrong box being ticked. Um, uh, it's also that in the substantive bit of text. There's no suggestion that what you wanted was to have a different form of order if you didn't succeed in your primary case. And you would have been certainly been able to say that in there if that's what you were saying. So it's not just not box ticking. But even beyond that, you would have, as Master of the Rules observed, to tell us what the order was that you wanted. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and formulate it in some way. And that, that wasn't done either. That is a substantive difficulty quite apart from the form of it. Well, it's a procedural difficulty, we would say. And um, uh, the court, having heard argument, um, in my respectful submission, does have the power in its inherent jurisdiction to waive procedural requirements. It, it's, not, it, it's not procedural. This court can only operate on under its proper processes. And the first paragraph of your respondent's notice says the respondent seeks to contend that the order of the court below should be upheld for reasons other than those given by the court, namely that Article 13 supports the court's conclusion that the appellant is required to consider regularising, etc. Now, that's another reason, apparently, for what the court ordered. And as you rightly said, you appeal orders. And if you want to make, if you want this court to make another order, it's not just a procedural matter. You have to get permission from this court at what is now an unbelievably late stage with a draft as to what is the order you ask us to make. And, and you know, it's no good saying it's a public law matter and it's all very important and we must do what we think is right. That is not the way this court operates. I wholly accept that, my lord. Um, I wholly accept that. And of course, I, I myself was in a, a not dissimilar situation on the last occasion when this matter came before the court. But I, um, uh, I, I recognise that the um, uh, failure to um, indicate on the form what the consequences would be of the... Um, we Respondents have it succeeding, succeeding on Article 13 and failing on, uh, on, on any other aspect of the, of, of, of the argument. But um, I would respectfully submit that um, in the same way that the court sought fit to make a, take a pragmatic approach in, on the last occasion in respect of the procedural matters arising uh, from the Secretary of State's late change of case, um, and the pragmatic response that the court got from us. Well, that resulted in an adjournment. Well, that, Everybody that, had an opportunity to consider their position, but what's Mr. Tam supposed to do if you give him a draft this afternoon that uh, is some completely new request for relief? I, 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 I wholly understand that, and that's a difficulty for Mr. Tam, and I'm sure he'll make his submissions. My respectful submission would be that 
if the court rules, having heard the, the argument, that consequences flow from uh, Article 13.1, which have not hitherto been recognised in the Secretary of State's policy guidance to decision makers or elsewhere in the NRM, then it would be proper, having ruled on what the law means, then to um, having heard from Mr. Tan to make an appropriate order reflecting that ruling on the law. I mean, the problem you've got is it's quite a serious and different allegation to make. That there, there is, I mean, the term regularization of the status, um, you know, as my lord has demonstrated it throughout the entirety of this morning, is quite a difficult piece of terminology to what you're talking about. And, and just to land that on Mr. Tam's desk this afternoon and say, well, now deal with that because it comes up under Article 13. Anyway, as far as I'm concerned, seems a rather difficult position to adopt. I mean, I'm just looking in your skeleton uh, for um, reference to it. suggest any different relief under the part of your skeleton relating to Article 13. Indeed, regularization is not mentioned in paragraphs 4.16 and following. That, if I may say so, is consistent. I'm just looking with how it's just Justice Mostyn deals with this point, paragraph 40, where he was against you, of course, which is Respondent's notice, but he records your submissions as being having set out Article 13 um, and the reference to the final sentence. Uh, so you submit it refers to the period up to the conclusive grounds decision. Therefore, in that period, the state must authorize the person to stay here. That can only be done by a grant of discretionary leave. So Kindly to your credit, your case has been consistent, it seems, throughout, that it's, it's, it's discretionary leave that you are after, and discretionary leave that, or that you are after a policy regulating, and uh, that 13.1 was relied on in support of that argument, not as a separate argument, well, something short of discretionary leave will do. It was, it was the case that the 10, 12, and 13 should be read together, and so much is clear from our skeleton argument. Our, our primary, our complaint was that, the rid, that there was a rigid rule whereby the Secretary of State would not treat a, a, a referral into the NRM as a, as a, a, a trigger for um, Article 3, uh, uh, Section 3C of the Immigration Act, and, the, uh, and it was a rigid rule that the Secretary of State would not consider, could not consider granting discretionary leave until the CG point was reached. That was the case as set out in the grounds and skeleton argument. Articles 10, 12, and 13 were prayed in aid to that end. Um, of course, I accept entirely that uh, if and to the extent that the consequences of succeeding on only part of the argument was that a different order would be sought, I should have flagged that up and take responsibility for that, but uh, this is, it is not in my respectful submission a situation which cannot be cured without 
um, causing injustice to Mr. Tan. If the court makes a ruling on the legal issues arising, on which argument has been heard from, from both sides, if the um, court is of the view that it's appropriate to make an order reflecting what the court's determination of the legal issue is, then plainly Mr. Tam is given an opportunity to make whatever submissions he makes on the form of order. That, in my respectful submission, would cure any potential um, uh, injustice to the Secretary of State. Right. For my part, Ms. Preston, if you want to make this argument, you're going to have to draft the order that you want as an amended respondent status and apply for permission to put that amended respondent status before the court and we'll hear argument from Mr. Tam when we've got the draft. Um, I, take, I take that point and take that direction. I'll get on that um, with my those sitting behind me. Sitting. There's no other way to deal with it. We can't just ignore the rules. I, I'm not uh, seeking to ask the court to do that, obviously. I would want as much fairness to Mr. Tam as indeed... Well, it's not, it's not a question of fairness to Mr. Tam, at least of all Mr. Tam personally. No, I mean, it's Mr. Tam... The Secretary of State has a large department dealing with these matters and needs to have notice of what's being argued. That's only fair, and I, I, uh, I must accept that. Right. Okay, is there anything else? Um, may I turn my back on them? We have nothing further unless I can see. Thank you very much, Ms. Weston. So, Mr. Butler. Thank you, my Lord. Um, there were three, there were three grounds of appeal in KTT. Ground one, which raised the question, what's the proper construction of Article 14 ECAS? Ground two, which raises the question, did the Secretary of State's policy commit to complying with Article 14 ECAS? And there was ground three, which raised the question, is a breach of that policy commitment, if it exists, justiciable? As we understand it, ground three has now completely gone. If the policy didn't commit to complying with Article 14, then I lose. But if, on its true construction, the policy committed to complying with Article 14, then, as I understand it, the Secretary of State now accepts that a breach of that policy commitment is justiciable. So unless the court indicates that I should deal with it in some way, um, I wasn't proposing to say any more about justiciability. Well, that's my understanding of where we are, Mr. I'm Butler. I'm grateful. Mr. Um, Mr. Tam will jump up if he thinks we're somewhere else. Uh, so I then propose to deal with grounds one and two in that order, if I may. Mm -hmm. But before I turn to ground one, could I identify what we say are the essential factual context? KTT claimed asylum on the 22nd of January 2019. The asylum claim rests solely on the claim that KTT would be at risk of re-trafficking in Vietnam. On the 31st of October 2019, the single competent authority conclusively determined that KTT is a victim of modern slavery including through slavery in a country of origin, Vietnam. The decision under challenge in these proceedings, that is the refusal of leave under the trafficking policy,
was taken on the 17th of August 2020. At that stage, the Secretary of State's decision on the asylum claim was pending. At that stage, removal was subject to the statutory presumption that it would pose an unacceptable risk of refoulement. In this case, by returning KTT to the place where she feared re-trafficking. Is that the right way of putting it? I'm not unacceptable. It would be refoulement. Would be pose an unacceptable risk of refoulement. That, that, that may be a better way of putting it. I'm, going to, I'm going to show my Lord and authority in a moment, and I can't quite remember now how Lord Stevens put it, but I'll show my Lord in a moment. Okay. Uh, just just to f before I get to that point, uh, the Secretary of State took an asylum decision on the 23rd of April 2021. The claim was refused. Give me the date again. 23rd of April 2021. That's two and a half bit years after the application. That claim was refused, but significantly was not certified as manifestly ill founded. With the consequence that KTT could and did appeal. In the absence of certification, removal is prohibited by statute pending appeal. And in my submission, it's not the bar on removal per se that is significant, as much as what it represents. And uh, the statutory bar again, pending the appeal, is in recognition of the risk of refoulement. And could I please hand up uh, an extract of an authority to, just to make that proposition good? In the five or six bundles of authorities, then, um, uh, this one was overlooked. And it's My the Lord. only one you're going to refer to, I suppose. We took a relatively <laughs> restrained approach to what we put into the bundle. I don't take responsibility for the vast majority of what's in there. Well, can you make sure it's sent electronically, please? We'll do that, my lord. Um, just to put the point in context, this, this, was, this judgment's 100 or so pages, so we've only handed up an extract. Um, the case concerned the effect of an asylum claim on a request for the return of a child under the Hague Convention. And in the course of determining that issue, the Supreme Court identified the function of the statutory bar that I've just described. And if my lords would please look at uh, internal page 781. 7 what one? 781. At the bottom of that page, one sees paragraph 103. And Lord Stevens there identifies the obligation to have an effective appeal procedure in relation to asylum claims. And then if my Lords would please look over Leaf, three lines, or four lines down, one sees section 78 of the 2002 Act, which is the statutory bar pending appeal, provides protection from refoulement whilst an appeal pending. It's an obvious point, but I wanted to make it good. So, sorry, I mean, so what is the point? The point is simply that section 78 says you can't be returned. So, so, well, its function, its premise, is the risk of reform if you return pending the appeal. 
I th shows I'm not a proper immigration asylum lawyer. I thought refoulement more simply meant return to the country where you w were persecuted. Yes, Does it means something different. But that presupposes that you've been persecuted, which one doesn't know until the outcome of the appeal. So it's the oh, risk. Oh, I of, see. So it's the risk of refoulement. Well, I know, well, I'm not going to argue about well, it. Well, can, 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 can I just explain why I make a point? So where an asylum claim is based on fear of re-trafficking, as here, there is a presumed risk of re-trafficking pending the determination of the appeal, unless the Secretary of State has certified the claim. So that's the context for this, this case. Just to finish off the chronology, as, as I think Mr. Tan said yesterday, the appeal, the asylum appeal, hasn't yet been listed to be heard. Mr. Justice Linden recorded that it was estimated that it would be heard by around October this year, October 2022, and that remains our best guess. So in this case, the period between the conclusive grounds decision and the tribunal decision will be over two years. Is that, we've heard a lot about the delays in decision making by the Secretary of State, is a two year delay between the lodging of an appeal and uh, its hearing, the first year tribunal, is that standard at the moment? I, I, don't, I don't have any figures, but it raised no eyebrows on our side. Well, in fact, the, the relevant chronology is from 23rd of April 21, which was the oh. Secretary of State's decision refusing because you couldn't appeal until yeah. you had that. That's right. You, Got it. you went back to, uh, for understandable reasons, to the conclusive grounds decision, which was, was, was not what the appeal is from. No, but in, in, in the ordinary case, which we're contemplating, yeah. One would expect the discretionary leave decision in relation to trafficking to be taken at the conclusive ground stage. Yeah. And so if things had run as we say they ought to have run, we would have benefited from a period of two plus years of discretionary leave. It's my fault. I misunderstood what period you were referring to. Um, so, so that was all I wanted to say by way of um, the factual context. And, and in the underlying factual context, there appears to be... Uh, a different sort of approach between, and it's not unusual, it happens very often in criminal proceedings, which is why there's a bit of jurisprudence about what is the status of a conclusive grounds authority. There's a bit of um, factual dispute between the Secretary of State about whether or not um, uh, the um, a, a, a respondent is a, a victim or, or was in fact a, a, a um, party to it, or it appears to be in some of the suggestions on the papers, is that right? Well, I'm in my, my because it's, it's, I mean, it's simply not open to the Secretary of State to make that insinuation mm -hmm. in circumstances where, in her capacity, a single competent authority, the Secretary of State has conclusively determined that KTT is a victim of modern slavery, yeah. including in Vietnam. And uh, at the moment, the, the FTT and UPA tribunal haven't got into the situation of the status of uh, single competent authority decisions and what their status is. It's, not in, dispute. it's yeah. not in dispute in the tribunal where the KTT is a victim of trafficking. And but the issue then is a risk of re-trafficking. The, the, the exactly. There'll, there'll be, as I understand it, I'm not doing that appeal, there'll be three questions for the tribunal to determine. One, would KTT be at risk of re-trafficking in Vietnam? Two, would she be afforded effective protection by the state from that risk of re-trafficking? And third, and relatedly, could she internally relocate safely? Internally in Vietnam? Yes. So, so that, that's the facts. Could I then please turn to issue one? the meaning of Article 14 ECAP. And I propose to make my submissions on four broad areas. First, what is the meaning of 
necessary. Second, whether necessary attaches to stay or permit. Third, whether a state can choose between 14.1a and 14.1b. I'm paraphrasing. Does that matter when they've not chosen in this case? That's my answer. <laughs> no. That's very quick then. But I thought the court might be interested to know what we say about the proper construction of it. Briefly, I sure. think. Well, I'll come, I'll, if I can take. I, I confess to being interested, but I confess, but I absolutely see the point. It doesn't really well, matter. It, so it, it, you should it, make it, your it, submissions. In a nutshell, point. we agree with Mr. Tam's construction on that point, and I respectfully adopt the um, point suggested by my Lord and Master Jerome's. It doesn't matter here because this, because the UK has chosen to. Vote. So Greta were right to say that that was in the proper way of reading 14.1a and b, and the United Kingdom has adopted to have both. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the third. I may already have dealt with the point. That, yeah. that was my third. Um, <laughs> my, my, my fourth area under this head, the meaning of stay. Well, I mean, this is going to be very quick, Mr. Butler, because the second submission, you're going to say the thing means what it says. Um, I, I can't exactly predict what you're going to say under one, so we'll, we'll let you develop that. I'm going to predict you're going to take us to PK Gun. I am, PK Gun, <laughs> of course, yes. Anyway, off, off you go. Thank I'm you. There. I'll, I'll try to. I, 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 I've sensed they steer from the questions yesterday, so I won't try and labour the points too heavily. I um, mean, the point that is most important for, for you to deal with, to, for, for my purposes anyway is the suggestion that Mr. Tan made more clearly than I think he's ever uh, made it before, that this is all about um, a long-term stay after um, a conclusive grounds decision, and if there is no other uh, regularization to adopt Ms. Weston's terminology uh, by asylum or humanitarian protection. Yes. Yesterday, was the first time well, you were we pushing understood that point to be raised, but I, I, I'll, I'll address it. Yes, well, you're, you're perfectly entitled, if I may say so, to address that point. <laughs> uh, so, so if, I, if I could quickly deal with the first three points in order. The first point, what's the meaning of necessary? Uh, that, as my Lord uh, the Vice President says, was determined by the Court of Appeal in PK Ghana. Uh, authority, Volume 1, Tab 4, page 151. The issue was identified by the court at page 159. Paragraph 39. We are thus concerned with only one narrow ground of appeal, namely that in adopting the compelling personal circumstances criterion, the Secretary of State's guidance fails properly to reflect Article 14.1a. <coughs> to answer that question, or to deal with that issue, the court needed to identify what necessary meant in Article 14.1. And it did that overly, page 160, paragraph 44. If I could please ask the court to read paragraph 44. See my, my lord turning to see what the footnote says. That's at page one hundred. <laughs> that's page one hundred and sixty-four. I've been spied on. Foot, 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 footnote two, and one sees there's a cross reference to Article Thirty-One of the Vienna Convention. Yeah. Uh, 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 
what are the objectives of the convention, the court gives the answer, the protection and assistance of victims of trafficking, and that is set out at paragraph 50. take this to mean the protection and assistance of victims of trafficking in their capacity as victims of trafficking. While we're in PK Ghana, could I also just deal with the meaning of the word considers, which one finds in Article 14.1? That's addressed at page 163, paragraphs 58 and 59. then to apply the meaning of necessary in this case. Our case concerns individuals who have to stay in the UK because pending the determination of their asylum appeal, return would give rise to an unacceptable risk of re-trafficking. And we say that that is capable of falling within the scope of Article 14, to take what the Court of Appeal said in PK Garner, necessary for the purposes of the protection of victims of trafficking, in their capacity as victims. To say it again, pending is, uh, have, to, have to stay in the UK. necessary for them to stay in the UK for the purposes of the protection of victims of trafficking in their capacity as victims. Now we accept that if the risk of refoulement relates to something entirely unconnected to trafficking, then it may be impossible to say that the victim's stay is necessary for the purposes of their protection or assistance in their capacity as victims. Not this case. Not this case. Well, not this case, the medical. Not on the basis not what's of being said in the tribunal. Not on the basis of the findings of the single competent authority, and and the way in which the asylum claim has been. Well, that's really the point, isn't it? Yes. It's, it's, it, 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 it is what you are um, applying for us, your asylum claim for protection against. Yes, exactly. So, uh, sorry, look, my lord's quite right. And there is importantly just a single point in the asylum claim, which is risk of re-trafficking in Vietnam. So it couldn't be clearer. Uh, and so also, in answer to my uh, Lord Vice President's question yesterday, a stay for the purposes of medical treatment, unconnected to trafficking, wouldn't be a stay that is necessary within the meaning of ECAT. But 
but why wouldn't it be necessary owing to their personal situation? I mean, why do you read it so narrowly, given the, the requirement to read a treaty in good faith and have regard to the fact that it's not unknown for victims of trafficking to develop medical situations either directly related to their experiences or unrelated? Well, I could see, maybe I've gone too far, I can see how the argument might be put. But if, for example, whilst here and whilst recovering from the situation of trafficking, a victim has an entirely unconnected diagnosis of some illness, one might ask, well, why is that subject to protection by ECAN? Why can't, compatibly with ECAN, the state require the victim to return to the country of origin and receive whatever treatment might be available there? Well, yes, I think to make it difficult, let us assume a case, it is for the purpose of a completely unconnected illness, but of a rare kind which in the country of origin would effectively not be treated. Uh, your position, which may seem hard line, but I see intellectually consistent, is that's not for their protection as a victim of trafficking. If the fact that they may then succumb to the illness and return, it would be just like one of those hard Article 3 cases. It would be like... Well, I can't, I can't remember where we've got to. Um, Papish Billy against whichever country it is. Georgia. But Georgia. Yes. Um, yeah. okay. Now, could I just deal with the way in which Mr Justice Linden addressed this point? Um, if the court would please turn up the core bundle at page... 291. Which paragraph? I'm so sorry? Which paragraph? Uh, it, it, it's it's um, his declaration in his order. Oh, the order? The order. Sorry, then give me the core bundle reference. Call, call bundle page 291. So sorry, I was just writing something down. Well, it's page 291, but if my Lord's working from the hard copy bundle, the page numbers have dropped off this section. Right, it's, it's not that I can't find it, it's just I was getting behind. But page 291. 291, yep. And this is, this is part of Mr Justice Linton's order, uh, and one sees the second declaration. And all that he declared was that KTT's situation was capable of constituting a stay that was necessary, but left it to the Secretary of State to decide. The Secretary of State gave effect to that declaration by granting KTT six months' leave to remain. And so we say the Secretary of State must have accepted that on Mr Justice Linden's construction of Article 14, it was necessary to grant leave to KTT. Or the Secretary of State just made a six-month leave. I mean, that, unless you've got the decision letter saying that's the basis, I think it's quite a big inference to, to give when you've got contested litigation coming up all this way. Well, we, 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 we have got the, the decision, um, if you want to see it. Um, but does it give that as the reason? Um, I think I'd better double-check. Um, I'm, I'm told from behind it doesn't give a reason. Well, uh, which is entirely what one, one, one would expect. Uh, all I'm saying is that you may have better points than trying to infer what the Secretary of State thought, and that's your best point. I'm <laughs> prepared to leave that point where I've, uh, where I've left it. Uh, so that was the first uh, topic under this head, the meaning of necessary. Um, second, um, at, at the risk of being told that this is all absolutely clear, uh, is it the victim's stay which must be necessary, or the grant of a permit which must be necessary? Uh, and we respectfully agree with my Lord the Master of the Rolls that as a matter of ordinary language, the answer is clear. Article 14 requires that their stay is necessary, not that the permit is necessary. And with great respect to the Secretary of State, we say that any other reading would be uh, Alice in Wonderland stuff to pick up the theme that was um, raised yesterday. I thought it was something.
Humpty Dumpty. Well, same same book, I think, my lord. I mean, uh, was it through the looking glass? I think so. Yeah. Well, rather than Wonderland. Oh well, maybe it was. Maybe it was. I'm so sorry. I'm, I thought I, that was the Wonderland point. I'm so sorry. I stand correct. I, I shouldn't <laughs> attempt any literary reference. It's always going wrong. Um, what would be the consequences of Mr. Tam's submission, if necessary, attached to permit? Then Article Fourteen One would never be engaged if the member state simply allowed the victim to stay. For example, if a member state passed a law or undertook that victims of trafficking couldn't be removed from its territory, then on the Secretary of State's construction of Article 14, a residence permit would never fall to be issued in that state. And by that simple device, a state could render Article 14 one nuclear. And that, in my submission, can't have been the intention of the draft. Could I then ask, please, the court to look at Article 12, um, which is Volume 2 of the Authorities, page 573. As the court has already seen, the support described at 12.1 and 12.2 is available with or without a residence permit. Three and four are only applicable if the victim has a residence permit. And in a, in a, in a number of the authorities, that has been described as basic as opposed to enhanced trafficking support. What one and two has been described? One and basic. two basic, yeah. three and four enhanced. Now, if the, if the court would please uh, compare Article 12.1b, access to emergency medical treatment, with Article 12.3, necessary medical assistance, we can see that all potential uh, uh, victims are entitled to, under uh, ECAT, is access to emergency medical treatment. Only victims who have a residence permit are entitled, under ECAT, to necessary medical treatment. That is then reflected in the explanatory report, tab 15, page 619, Paragraph 157, final sentence, makes the point that I've already made. Full medical assistance is only for victims lawfully resident in the party's territory. Sorry, I, I just missed where you were. Page 619. Yeah. Pa paragraph 157, yeah. final sentence. Full medical assistance is only for victims lawfully resident in the party's territory yeah. under Article 12, Paragraph 3. Uh, and to see what that means, we can look over the page at paragraph 165. So 165, under paragraph 3, each party is required to provide the necessary medical or other assistance to victims lawfully resident in its territory who don't have adequate resources and need the assistance. Lawfully resident victims are, in particular, nationals and persons with a resident residence permit referred to in Article 14. And then to read the last four lines at the end of the, uh, uh, that sentence, end of that line, this medical assistance is not just a question of availability of emergency medical care as provided for in paragraph 1b, 
For example, the medical assistance might be assistance to a victim during pregnancy or with HIV stroke AIDS. So ECAP contemplates that a victim won't get non-emergency treatment during pregnancy or non-emergency HIV care without a residence permit. Now, my point here isn't about arrangements for the medical care of victims of trafficking in the UK. Because that's, in fact, they do get such treatment. Precisely. My point is about what ECAT guarantees and what light that casts on the proper interpretation of Article 14. So on my construction of Article 14, any victim whose stay in the territory is necessary for the purposes of protection or assistance as a victim of trafficking is guaranteed necessary medical, medical treatment. By contrast, on the Secretary <coughs> of State's construction of Article 14, a victim whose stay in the territory is necessary but who doesn't need a permit to secure that stay, the victim isn't guaranteed necessary medical treatment under ECAP. And in my submission, the Secretary of State's construction is strong, strongly contrary to the purpose of ECAP. As I've already uh, pointed out, it would mean, for example, that the state could, under ECAT, withhold necessary medical care for a, from a pregnant victim by allowing the victim to stay in the territory without a residence permit. Might, I suppose, be argued that the fact that they um, needed emergency medical treatment was a reason and which they could only get if they had leave, that would mean they needed leave or needed, needed a permit. It's not the way that the explanatory report contemplates it. No, but the explanatory report is contemplating short timescales. <coughs> well, that's, that's slightly the problem with all this. I, I, I'm not sure that I take that with respect from the explanatory report. I'll come on to the question of what stay means shortly. Mm. But even supposing that were right, if, I, if I'm right to say that permits aren't available in respect of medical needs that aren't connected to being a victim of trafficking, then somebody who needed HIV treatment for reasons unconnected to their trafficking wouldn't be able to get it for so long as the state said, well, it's all right, you can stay here, but I'm not going to grant you a permit. A similar point could be made about Article 12.4 of ECAP. This is um, that a residence permit is the gateway to work subject to the rules of the particular member state. And again, that's explained in the explanatory report. We could just pick up where we were if my Lords had still got it open. Uh, paragraph third paragraph of that explanatory note rather looks as if it sort of reads it down for, for its natural meaning. I'm so sorry, the third 
Oh, paragraph 166. Third line in the third, third sentence. Third yeah, sentence. sorry, third sentence, yeah. Doesn't establish an actual right of access to the labour market. No. But each party shall adopt rules under which they shall be authorised to have access. Yes. So okay. it doesn't, we accept that it doesn't necessarily guarantee the right to work for victims. All that it does, as it says, is requires the state to adopt rules that govern the circumstances in which victims with permits can access the labour market. But a precondition to access is a permit. And it's rather oddly. Rather, oh, see, it's a permit. It's rather oddly in opposite to 178, which we've been looking at. The authorisation needn't involve an issue in the administrative documents. What we need to do is to talk about. Interesting, but not for today. No, <laughs> no. Um, could I just emphasise, though, what what said at the third and fourth line of 166, the drafters' views that these measures are desirable for helping victims reintegrate socially and, more particularly, take greater charge of their lives. So this promotes one of the purposes of ECAP. Now, in, in the UK, um, as we've heard, the, the rules are that all victims with leave to remain have the right to work. Those are our uh, labour market rules. And the views of the drafters that this is desirable for helping victims reintegrate, etc., are underscored by the research that has been conducted in this field. I don't know to what extent the court wants to look at this. That, that, that there is some material in the uh, bundle uh, conducted by academics which underscores this point and also makes the point that it results in significant savings to the Treasury. It may be too much detail. Um, if it would be of interest, I can turn it up. Well, you can give us the reference. Uh, it's, it's a statement, a witness statement by Katerina Schwarz at the University of Nottingham, Supplementary Volume 2, page 604, and in particular, paragraphs 39 to 42 and 47. And just one more document on this point. KTT's evidence in this case is that she wishes to work to give her life purpose. And the reference to that is supplementary volume two, page 634, paragraph 24. That was all by way of submission on the question of whether necessary attaches to stay or permit. The third question, does a member state have a choice to make, uh, to, to make arrangements for granting residence permits only in the situation governed by 14.1a or only in the situation governed by 14.1b? I've given the court my answer on that. Yes, it can. But that, we say, doesn't advance Mr. Tam's case for two reasons. First, if a state does choose to implement 14.1a, then the words and meaning of 14.1a apply. And second, there is rightly no suggestion that the UK has only chosen to implement 14.1b. Yeah. The, the fourth and final question in respect of ground one of the appeal uh, the meaning of stay. Um, as I say, this, this wasn't raised as an issue before Mr Justice Linden, and I have to confess we only picked it up yesterday as an issue in this case at all. As we now understand it, the Secretary of State contends that there are stays, and then there are stays, and that an interim or temporary stay won't do. Well, it's not that it won't do. It's that it's not what it's about. It's it is about the period after um, conclusive grounds of 
been established and the asylum claim is being dealt with as the response. Well, can I can attempt to address that case? Uh, and I, I would make eight points in response. I'll try and jump through them. First, there is no express limitation to that effect in the language of Article 14. Second, to read such a limitation into Article 14 would, in my submission, undercut the overarching purpose of ECAP. It would mean that victims who have to stay in the territory on an interim basis, in light of the risk of re-trafficking if returned, that they would not be guaranteed necessary medical treatment under ECAT, And that would be contrary to the Article 1 ECAT purpose of providing a comprehensive framework for the protection and assistance of victims. Why would a victim who is at risk of re-trafficking on return be in this jurisdiction only on a temporary basis? Well, our situation is one. Mm. Because you're claiming asylum? Because we're claiming asylum. It might be, one can, one can contemplate other situations. It may be that the risk is a transient one in the country of origin. Well, it all depends what the distinction is. But it may be that an investigation would need to be made in the country of origin to see whether the risk genuinely exists but falling short of an asylum claim. But you say primarily because you're seeking asylum. It is because you are seeking asylum and because in the present state of affairs in this country that commits you to um, a long-term stay. Well, that's uh, no, Sorry, the stay which is interim, which is conceptually interim, but actually long-term. Yes, I, I, I may have misunderstood your point. Yeah, well, no, my, my point is, is, is rather more of a, of a, of a structural um, one and with regard to the purpose of ECAD, but, but bringing it back... Oh, the, sorry, no, well then, no, you've thought about this carefully. Come back to my point. Well, I, fin I, I, I finished my, my purpose point, but okay. if I, so if at, this, at this point, if it's convenient to come, come back to the point my Lord makes, that I, I would accept that if there were no practical significance because there was a prompt determination of the asylum claim and a prompt hearing of the appeal, then there may be no purpose in the victim seeking um, a permit in the interim, seeking leave in the interim. And we wouldn't be here. No, but the point is, what is the structure? Well, that's what I'm addressing. ECAT. That's what I'm addressing. And, and the, Mr. Tam says the structure of ECAT is this is after the applications have been dealt with. And you can see that from the explanatory and other materials. Yes. But it's it, and the structure indeed of the of the convention itself. But it's talking about um, permits for the long term. Well, and I'll come, yes, you're going to come. You've got six more points. Yes, I've got six <laughs> more. I, I'm going to come back to the structure. Yeah. Um, but but, but, but in our, I, I do respectfully um, disagree with the suggestion that it can either be spelt out of the convention itself or that there's any suggestion in the explanatory report mm -hmm. that this situation isn't covered. Mr. Tam has asserted that this kind of stay isn't contemplated by ECAT. There's nothing to that effect in the convention. There's nothing to that effect in the explanatory report. Mm. Well, it might be sensible if there were, but there let's, isn't. Let's hear your six points, yes. and then, then we might have some left over for you. <laughs> <coughs> So what, what, where I am, I've said no, 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 no express limitation in the language of either 
ECAT or the explanatory. Undercut overarching purpose. Number two, undercut overarching purpose with the example of deprivation of necessary medical treatment. Third, there is no dispute that Article 14.1a covers stays to receive short term or interim medical treatment. or temporary stays for the purpose of recovery. Article 14.1a is clearly not limited to stays with any particular degree of permanence. It might be that the victim only needs to complete a course, short course of counselling, but that would fall within 14.1a. Within Well, if by some reason you needed a permit in order to have counselling. No, that's not my point, my Lord. If one needs to stay, if one's stay is necessary for the defined purpose of 14.1a, then a permit needs to be granted. That's what 14.1 says. And given the nature of this stay that it's being contemplated in 14.1a, that must necessarily cover short-term, interim, temporary stays. I wonder, well, at some point, but in, maybe we should wait to the end of your eight points, but can I just flag up now? We need to split out two different concepts, interim or temporary on the one hand, as opposed to um, permanent on the other. And short and long in terms of duration. Because you could have a, although Mr. Tam talked about longer term, you could have a short term, um, you could have an interim period that was very long. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, you can tell I'm thinking aloud, but uh, we want to be careful of our terminology. I, I said and part of your problem, I suspect, is you don't quite know what case you're meeting, because I don't quite know. Um, uh, Mr. Tam, since we don't really have the benefit of any oral or written submissions on this, used different phrases already, and I'm not sure I got them all down. Longer term is a key concept, so. Anyway, keep going. I would like, I accept. It's, it's really the stay post determination. In, in other words, the stay. For the, for the longer term, because it is after the determinations have been dealt with. Well, which and determination, what, which determinations are you talking about? Well, the, any determinations that need to be made. So in this, in our case, it's asylum and victim trafficking, but it wouldn't always be. Well, my Lord, the, 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 the ECAT convention isn't concerned with asylum. Well, I know it's not, but, the, but that's what Mr. Tam says, because in his policy, it's made perfectly clear you should wait before deciding on a permit to see what the whether there is a better, uh, more advantageous um, permission available to the victim. Well, that was quashed. No, no, I don't think that's been quashed in um, in the current guidance that we're asking for. Oh, I see. The, 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 the suggestion that it might be... Well, it's, not a, it's very clear. I mean, we, the one thing that we never look at in this case is the, is the policy that is impugned. But the policy that's impugned is very clear. The person who drafted it plainly understood that what they were doing was waiting until determinations had been made and then deciding whether the person needed a permit. Yeah. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's what well, the person I'm contemplated. Sorry, I, I, will take my, I will take the court to this in due course, but just so that we're clear at this stage, yes, version two of the policy is what we're concerned with. Very clearly said, you shouldn't determine the application for leave pending the asylum claim. That passage of the policy was quashed by the, by the High Court in JP, and it was quashed nine months before KTT's application was determined. And that's why KTT's case was, was, was KTT's application for ECAT leave was considered before her asylum claim was determined. Okay, well, I've got to, be, we've got to be shown that case. I, I, I will, I will, I will. That in mind. That's Mr. Justice Murray, is it? That's Mr. Justice Murray. And again, I think unappealed, not case of permission refused. Unappealed. Not appealed. Yeah. 
Um, but I, I, I will come back to that. But could, could I, at the risk of um, being pulled in different directions, could I, could I, could I um, try and answer my Lord um, the Vice President's um, question about, or, or point about the need to be clear about distinguishing between whether one's talking about an interim period, um, differentiating that from short or long term. I accept the point. One can have an interim period which is long, one can have an interim period which is short. What I've been dealing with in my third, third of eight points is uh, short-term medical treatment. Now, I put it as short-term, but one could equally contemplate medical treatment that's interim on the basis that one's waiting a particular diagnosis and just needs to stay pending the diagnosis. And if the diagnosis is all clear, then the stay is no longer necessary. There's nothing particularly unusual conceptually about waiting for something and needing leave for that waiting period. That it is waiting for a determination of whether it's safe to go back to the country of origin through the determination of an asylum claim doesn't put the situation in a completely different category. And that would pick up renewable on the basis that you know you 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 get your diagnosis and unfortunately you do need further treatment so it's renewable. My fifth point which I'll come to oh, in a moment. <laughs> I, I, I've just finished off point three. Point four Article fourteen one B covers stays pending police investigations or criminal trials. And by their nature, those stays are interim. They may be shorter or longer term, depending on how long the investigation takes or how long the trial takes. But they're interim. They're pending the police's conclusion or they're pending the criminal court's determination. Yes, but they are interim, but they are for a defined period a purpose in time, if you like. So um, once the process of becoming a victim of trafficking has concluded, uh, there is then a discernible need, if there is, to stay for that process to be complete, at the end of which you don't need to stay. Yes. And the question is um, then whether you need, whether you should get a permit for that. Yes. Period. yes. But, but that is, in a sense, um, a, a longer term stay. Point is obviously a very good one. What, what does all that mean? But it, 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 it is at least definable as to what the period is. Whereas under one, what the Secretary of State is saying is that this is for uh, effectively a permanent stay, yes. and a renewable permit. That's the word renewable that appears twice. Well, I, I don't know what the proposition being put is that 14.1b is different in character. 14.1a, and the stay has a different stay has a different connotation in b than it does in a. In my submission, the concept of stay is is common in both a and b, and in both it's capable of um, dealing with an interim situation or it's capable of dealing with a indefinite uh, position. But to, 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 to take on the point that my lord the master of the rolls um, uh, makes, the situation pending a criminal trial is conceptually identical to the position between a conclusive grounds decision and the determination of the asylum claim, whether it's safe for that individual to go back to Vietnam in light of the risk of re-trafficking. Exactly the same conceptually to getting a conclusive grounds decision and having to stick around in the UK pending the outcome of the prosecution. I mean, conceivably, you're both right, in a way, because conceivably, it was intended to cover the longer-term position, but is also competent to cover the shorter-term position. Well, that may be right, and I would be... Well, obviously, I'd be very happy accept that. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, because, uh, I mean, conventions are not drafted in 
the same way as, as domestic legislation, where one can normally see what's being got at. Uh, and they are drafted with purpose strongly in mind and flexibility in mind. Whether we think that's good as common lawyers, I don't know, but it's what it is. And you, you might say, even if um, bits, of, bits of it make it look as if it's talking about the long term, um, it is certainly competent to cover an extended period which may not have been contemplated when the treaty was, was drafted, uh, but in fact has happened not only here but all over the all over the, the contracting states. I mean that that argument seems to me at least to have some um, more attraction than the binary argument um, uh, that it was forever in, uh, it was forever intended to um, cover this particular period. Yes, oh my, my lord, I'm, I'm not suggesting I'm not suggesting that the drafters had this precise factual scenario in mind that confronts the court. They didn't. No, I, I'm not suggesting that. I, my, my submission is very much that 14.1a is competent <coughs> to deal with this situation. I mean, remember, even when Mr. Tam was arguing this point yesterday, the case was in a different form. It was only this morning that he conceded, effectively, uh, that, um, you know, we would... We can look at the matter on the basis that Article 14 um, uh, was intended to be implemented. Yes. And, and that changes everything. I mean, obviously, he doesn't quite put it like that, and I'm not intending to replicate exactly what he did say, because I wrote it down so as to make sure that I remembered it. But apart from that, uh, the point I'm making is, yesterday, we were thinking this wasn't the main point, but it, it now becomes the main event. Yes. If he's wrong about uh, necessary. Yes. Well, I, I, the way I would put it is, it's a it's a last ditch that has been erected <laughs> in this court, but here we are. Um, yes, yeah, <laughs> not erected. You don't erect. No, you don't erect it. Yeah. Doug, Doug, I think I should say. Sorry. Um, <laughs> keep going so, because yes, I think my, you're my, only on four. I'm only on four, my lord. <laughs> my, 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 my lord, I I, I I I was trying to address the proposition that my lord just put, and I was respectfully agreeing that an appropriate way of looking at this is to say that 14.1 is apt to cover this situation even if it wasn't in the minds of the drafters. Except that. The point I've been seeking to make in respect of my third and fourth point, what I sought to point out, was that it must have been in the contemplation of the drafters that there would be some shorter term or interim situations yeah, that. that would be governed. That is your fourth point, and it's well made. And you say stay means stay wherever it says stay. And uh, there's authority in the case of Oxfordshire City Council against Oxfordshire County Council, where Lord Hoffman said words used in the same statute don't always mean the same, even in succeeding clauses. But well, you well, say that's not this case. That's not this case. No. It's a great authority, though, if you ever need it. Uh, <laughs> about, I've, I've, if you yeah, ever need it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pick up the reference. <laughs> it all depends, like everything else in the yes. rules of construction. Con context and purpose um, may be decisive. Mm. Yes. Um, fifth, to come back to the point that my Lord, Lord Justice Kingdom has made, that the, the permit, that, that the permit is to be renewable, may or may not cast light on the quality of the stage that is required. It might be thought simply to indicate that the permit must be renewed if the Article, Article 14 grounds subsist at the expiry of the initial permit. It's a common sense provision that you're not turfed out if you still need Article 14 help at the expiry of the permit period. And, and it contemplates, you would say, that uh, periods of uh, permit may be different in different countries for different reasons. Yes. But my Lord, I go a little bit further, and I say that if anything, the requirement for renewability indicates that the stay may be of uncertain duration, and it may be short term. Otherwise, there would be less need for a permit to be renewable. 
a long-term permit or a permit of fixed duration could simply be granted at the outset. Yes. Well, six points is uh, it's not really a submission of law. Is it? I don't know whether your I, I you I'm sure will have it at your fingertips. There is some commentary on the requirement of renewability in um, the explanatory report. I can't quite remember what it says, but I remember thinking that it was marginally helpful to Mr. Tam's the weight Mr. Tam put on. Do you have the passage in mind? If not, I'll have to find it. I, I, I don't. I can say that the, the passage on Article 14 begins at page 622. Well, if I don't find it quickly, um, I suspect that one will be still here tomorrow. I will put it. Um, yes, I'm told by uh, I was thinking 188. Yeah. Even though the convention does not specify any length of residence permit, it does provide it has to be renewable. Now, well, it's, I, uh, looking at it again, it looks pretty neutral. Yes. Perhaps I was thinking more of a point about paragraph three. If what governs whether it is has to be renewed is whether the Article 14 1A conditions still subsist, yes. change, why is there room for why is there any room for the operation of the internal law of the uh, of the country? That seems to I don't quite know what sort of thing they have in mind. Well, it might be a it might situation... might be if you've misbehaved. It, it might be something like Section 3C of the 1971 Act. There are automatic rollover provisions or things of that kind that aren't governed by the Convention but can be governed by domestic law. Oh, I see. Well, maybe. I, I read it as more looking at things like you can withdraw a residence permit if someone misbehaves. Well, that may be right. That may be right. It may it may leave it open to the, to, 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 to the um, member state. Well, so anyway, I, 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 I don't know. You may not have any submissions on it, but that, I, I, don't think I, I thought do. we should look at it in this context. I, I, I don't think, it, well, it, it, let me put it this way. In, in my submission, um, paragraphs uh, 187, which say that um, the length of the residence permit is a matter of the party's discretion, and 188, which deals with renewability, they, they take the matter no, matter no further than the submission which I just made. 187 must set a length compatible with the provision's purpose. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, the, the, the sixth point is to, um, my sixth point is to illustrate uh, the points that I've already made by reference to the length of permits that are in fact granted in the UK. Now we've already seen in response to my Lord Lord Justice Dingleman's question what the policy says about the default position being 30 months. But in fact the, the reality is rather different and if the court would please look at the supplementary bundle, volume 2 Page 935 This is part of a report about child trafficking from 2020, but the figures which I'm going to show the court relate to all grants of discretionary leave to victims of trafficking. And if the court please look at the, the bottom right hand corner of page 935, there is the, the, the final paragraph begins the length of the discretionary leave, and then four lines down, the Freedom of Information Act data shows that for nearly three quarters, 74% of all victims of trafficking granted discretionary leave, the leave lasted between seven and 12 months. 
a total of 7.8% were granted leave of just zero to six months, only 9.1% were granted leave of 13 to 24 months, and 8.3% were more than 25 months. What's the period? Um, it doesn't say, I don't think. Uh, Mr. Tam asks. I think, well, it, the, earlier on it talked about 2016 to 2019. Right. Start, uh, and that, that, may, that may be right. That may be right. Uh, Mr. Tam asks me to draw attention to footnote 119. Well, that may have to be read out for people with my eyes. Uh, where, where multiple positive CG outcomes have been applied to a case with a DL grant, the latest CG outcome was used to calculate grant length. As such, figures may be underestimating DL grant length. I find that a bit opaque. What is multiple <laughs> positive CG outcomes? Surely you can only have one. Well, might have thought so. Well, it doesn't matter because it says the, the latest one is used to calculate the length or so what. I mean, that's obviously a tiny point. Well, Mr. Tam can make of it what he wishes. He can make that point in reply if it's his best point in reply. And um, the, the point I just wanted to make was that, um, as a matter of fact, um, in the UK at least, uh, appears to be granting... Well, what you're saying is that they're, they're always drafted for sh granted for short periods, as it turns out. Yes. Anyway, the 30 months was, as the kibosh put on it this morning. Um, the, my seventh point is that... Um, there is no exclusion of stays pending the determination of an asylum claim in ECA, which is, I think, the implication that Mr. Tam seeks to draw. Sorry, can you give us that proposition again? Yes, there is no exclusion. When, when it, looking at Article 14.1 and looking at the surrounding articles and looking at the explanatory report, there is nothing to exclude from the notion of stays in Article 14.1, stays pending the determination of an asylum claim. You may be about to make this point, but 40, Article 14 itself refers to the possibility that asylum claims may be being made. That's exactly the point I was going to make. By oh, right, sorry. Um, that one can go a little bit further. And, and point out, um, well, I've lost my, I've lost my eco. Fourteen five. One can see from fourteen five that the drafters contemplate a sequence whereby there would be one, the grant of a permit under Article 14.1, followed by the grant of a permit under the asylum regime. That's what Article 14.5 caters for. Uh, that featured quite a bit in Miss Justice Murray's judgment, didn't it? I think. Yes. But that rather undermines the suggestion that stays pending the determination of an asylum claim are somehow excluded from Article 14. Is that the only reference to asylum in Article 14? Only reference in Article 14. There is also Article 40, yes. which you will see at page 588, which is, um, as we see it, a standard clause in a convention of this kind, saying that it's not intended to interfere with other applicable conventions. One sees a mirror provision in the Refugee Convention. Yes, 
But it does expressly refer to the Refugee Convention of yes. 4. <coughs> but my real point is Article 14.5, that there's express contemplation yes, of the yes. sequence which we're concerned with. Yeah. My eighth and final point under this head, subject to any additional questions the court may have on it. My Lord the Master of the Rolls made the point that Chapter 3 of ECAP can be read as a scheme. And we respectfully agree. Working through the chapter, ECAT addresses reasonable grounds, interim protection, conclusive grounds, criminal investigation, compensation, permits, and repatriation. No, you went a bit quickly. Criminal Sorry. investigation. Criminal investigation, compensation. Compensation, permits. Permits, and, and repatriation. Now, can we please look at repatriation? That's Article 16, page 576. So we can see 16.1, return to the victim's home country should happen without undue delay. And then 16.5, <coughs> where the victim is repatriated, they should be supported to reintegrate re reintegrate into the society to which they are returned to avoid re-victimisation. Now, if one is reading Chapter 3 as a scheme, then, in my submission, one can see that Article 16 meshes with Article 40. If the victim has to stay, the situation is governed by 14. If the victim can't stay, the situation is governed by 16. Convention contemplates that the victim will be reintegrated into society, either the society of the receiving country, Article 14, or in the home country, Article 16. I mean, you're 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 right about that, of course, um, but um, it, it does envisage uh, long-term stays. But your answer to that is, well, it's a long-term stay after the conclusive grounds decision, not after an asylum decision, see Article 14. Yes, just not dealing with asylum claims. Dealing and, with and it's it's a red herring. Mm. And you say that if the if that's the Secretary of State's policy, it's a policy that is inconsistent with the scheme of the Act, in, in just the way that Mr. Tam yesterday said your submissions were. Yes. Scheme of the treaty. Of the treaty, yes. Yeah. Uh, what the convention doesn't contemplate is an indeterminate position where the victim has to stay but isn't integrated in the sense of being afforded necessary medical treatment in the sense of access to the labour market. I don't mean integration for the, in the sense of becoming a citizen of the country. But he's not, he's there without a permit, really. It doesn't contemplate being there without a permit, exactly. No, it contemplates if there is a stay after conclusive grounds. In other words, the decision made under Article 14, you say, is as to whether there is any reason 
either personal circumstances or uh, short-term cooperation with police in trials, um, why the victim needs to stay. And if the victim needs to stay, the victim it, it, it must have a permit. Yes, stay in their capacity as victim. In their capacity as victim. If, 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 if the victim um, doesn't have a need to stay in their capacity as victim, mm. the Convention contemplates they go home. Yeah, no, no. I mean, that's, of course, not what happens often, but um, that's what the Convention contemplates. Yes. And you say that's the more logical scheme because it uh, takes account of the fact that there may be delays, but uh, it's not instrumental. Delays are not, don't have to be in direct contemplation and wouldn't have been expected to be so. No. No. Okay. The, the, the happenstance of practice in the UK can't, in my submission, be a decisive point in considering the Convention. Can, can you, Mr. Butler, show me um, uh, the, Mr. Justice Murray's decision and which bit of the policy has been struck down? I can do that now. I'm, I'm going to. I was planning to take the court to that in the course of my submissions on ground two. If it's convenient, I can do it now. No, thank okay. you. Do it on ground two. Um, and I think that's where I'm now coming to. Is um, Round round two. Two. Coming to it, yeah. I think I finished, unless the court has any more questions. Yes, okay. Well, my lord would think it useful to do it sooner rather than later. It sounds as though that's what you're getting to anyway, near enough. I'm so sorry, my lord. Sorry. <coughs> it sounds as though you were getting to it anyway, or near enough. I'm, I'm, I'm close to it. Yeah. But there's not a ninth point, is there, Mr. Bass? There isn't enough. Well, <laughs> there isn't. I, I only had eight, but if, 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 if the court has any more that, the, that might be canvassed, I'd... Well, you just went back to four, so I mean, you know, I just don't want to go around in circles. Now, many Jacob. Pulling your leg. Sorry. <laughs> I hope that what I just said was that I've just about finished on issue one. Yeah, good. Round one. Um, proper construction of Article 14. So could I turn then, please, to issue two? The proper construction of version two of the discretionary leave policy. Now, as I understand, I understand where we got to this morning with Mr. Tam was that the Secretary of State accepts that this part of the appeal is an appeal against a finding of fact. And so the applicable standard of review by this court is not to interfere with Mr. Justice Linden's findings on this point unless there is some identifiable flaw in his analysis. And we respectfully say that the Secretary of State hasn't identified a flaw in Mr Justice Linden's analysis of the policy. But if I might give this... So I suppose, I see obviously why you characterise it as a question of fact as opposed to a question of law. It's a pretty unusual sort of question of fact. There ought to be a binary answer to it. It would be very unsatisfactory for the, that would be pompous for the rule of law if there wasn't a binary answer. We ought to be able to say what the Secretary of State's policy is from public statements of it. Uh, uh, that's how we had approached the matter before this morning. And what I was going to say to the court when coming to the question of what's the status of the concession in PK Ghana. I was going to make the point that it's a concession of fact. It's also effectively a concession of law. It was a matter of the proper construction of the policy that's before the Court of Appeal in BK <coughs> Ghana. On its true construction, the policy incorporated Article 14. And that because the Court of Appeal in PK Ghana accepted and applied that concession, that's now binding on this court. But Mr. Tan shied away from that approach this morning and said, no, 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 it's not binding. And the reason it's not binding is because it's all a question of fact. 
Well, he can't have it both ways. If it's a question, if it's a finding of fact, then the standard of review is the standard that's applicable to findings of fact. If it's a question of law or a quasi question of law, then P.K. Garner, in my submission, is binding at least in respect to the policy that was before that court. I mean, there's, there's a sort of middle ground I'm worried about here, because I'm looking at what he says his ground two is, that Mr Justice Lyndon wrongly interpreted the Secretary of State's policy as requiring leave to remain in circumstances for which the policy made no provision, and wrongly concluding that the failure of the policy to make provision for these circumstances made the policy effective as failing to give effect, full effect to Article 14. But if his argument on stay is right, and your argument on Article 14 is right, the one you've just made compellingly, if I may say so, um, then it's obvious that the policy didn't uh, comply, give full effect to Article 14, uh, because it wasn't intended to. It was actually talking about something else. So it's a sort of, um, I was going to use Latin, but I shun that. <laughs> QED. You can have an English translation for that. But it, isn't it? Is that right? I'm not sure I've, I can You haven't quite grasped it. See, the, the, the point that, that really appealed to me from Mr. Tan's submissions uh, yesterday was the, was the stay, the long term stay point. Yes. And, and you get that, not from the explanatory memo but from the policy. Yeah. And you, you see in the policy that the policy, the secretary, the drafter of the policy was definitely thinking, not in terms of short-term periods of, of, of um, a practical grant of, of, of permission, but of a permit for the longer term yeah. in a case of this kind. Yeah. And, and that seemed to me quite clear from the drafting. But if that's right, and that's all it's dealing with, then it must, and you're right on round one, then of course it's obvious that it wasn't dealing with half of what Article 14 is directed at, well, which is the period after a grounds decision has been made. Asylum is irrelevant, so it doesn't matter whether there's an asylum decision outstanding or not. You have to consider the leave permission, the permission to question leave immediately, mm. immediately within the confines of these things. Mm. And the policy doesn't suggest that. No. There, there, there are two... I'm, I'm going to come to develop this by main due course. There, there are two possible approaches where there are threads in the policy that pull in different directions. If the policy... One part of the policy indicates that the intention is to give effect to Article 14, mm. and another bit of the policy contains directions to caseworkers that appear inconsistent with the requirements of Article 14. That could, reading the policy as a whole, indicate that actually the Secretary of State wasn't seeking to give effect to Article 14 and was rather asking case workers to apply an attenuated version of 14 or something slightly different from Article 14, and that on its true construction is what the policy required. I accept that that would be a legitimate approach to construction. But another approach to construction and the one that I'm going to show the court was taken in P.K. Garner and the Tamawan and J.P. is that it's perfectly um, proper as a matter of construction to identify threads that pull in different directions and to say, well, not with the, 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 the overarching intention of this policy is to comply with Article 14, and insofar as it indicates to do something different, that's a mistake. And the policy to that extent flawed, because it's subservient to the overarching intention of the policy, which is to give effect. Right, I may not have seen where this is going. Is this over crude? I probably didn't see that enough. That you're saying there are two approaches. One is to say that the policy is flawed and must be quashed to the extent uh, that it doesn't comply with the uh, convention always assuming that was that was the intention. Uh, and you, you must then go back.
back to the Secretary of State and get them to reissue a new policy, it would be pretty clear what it will have to say. Well, depending on the nature of the flaw, it may be clear what it's got to say, but constitutionally they've still got to say it. That's approach one. Approach two is effectively to take a sort of analogy to Section 3 of the Human Rights Act and say, well, I know they don't say this, but we know what they, where they were trying to go, uh, and we will just say what they must have meant to say. And again, there'll be limits on that, depending just how adventurous you're feeling, but it will certainly allow you to disregard the actual words. If I may, is that, if if I may you, respectfully say so, that is a, a, an excellent analogy. Um, that, that, that's, in my submission, what Mr Justice Linden was effectively doing. Right. That's why you didn't like it when I, yesterday, said, well, the policy had to be quashed. You were saying there are construction methods of getting there. Yes, exactly, exactly. Well, we're going to have to look at the policy tomorrow. Yes. How are you doing for time? Um, I, I, I think I will be done within, certainly within an hour and a half. Okay. Um, and reply is not going to take the rest of the day, Mr. Tam. Is it? No. So we'll be finished comfortably within the day. Oh yes, I, I, I should think so. I'm su subject only to the possible googly that learned from Miss Weston might bomb tonight. Um, well, uh, Miss uh, Miss Weston's googly has been uh, prefaced, yes. and we know what it's likely to be. And uh, we'll have to deal with it when we see it. Lord Yes, yeah, so we've got the intervener. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, you'll be half an hour? That's how long we're giving you. <laughs> so, and that doesn't affect anything. No. OK, well, look, thanks very much. We'll sit again at uh, 10.30 tomorrow.